April is Donate Life Month and there are currently over 100,000 people in the U.S. awaiting a kidney transplant. A donated kidney can make all the difference in the life of someone with kidney failure. Our experts will talk about the process and benefits of living kidney donation and they'll answer your questions. That's coming up right now on At The Forefront Live. And we want to remind our viewers that today's program is not designed to take the place of a visit with your physician. Let's start off with having each one of our uh, experts identify themselves and introduce themselves to the audience and tell us a little bit about what you do here at U Chicago Medicine. And Dr. Barth, you're actually on set with me, so we'll start with you. Hi, I'm Dr. Rolf Barth. I'm a transplant surgeon here. I'm the Associate Director of the Transplant Institute. And at Chicago, I do the operations of kidney, pancreas, and liver transplants as well as the donor operations to take out the, the organs from our healthy donors. Yeah, we have some, uh, some interesting uh, information there to share in the program uh, about kind of a new procedure, uh, here anyway, that uh, you perform, which will be pretty, uh, pretty, I think, fascinating to our viewers here in a moment. Now, let's get to our other two guests who are joining us from remote locations as we continue to uh, social distance uh, the best, uh, to the best of our ability. And Dr. Queso, you're actually the closest to us, so we're going to start with you. Thanks for having me. I'm Yusuf Kiso, an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Chicago. I'm also a transplant nephrologist. Uh, most of my work is a clinical, focusing on uh, evaluating kidney transplant recipients, kidney donors, and patients with uh, multi-organ transplants. Um, I also do clinical research uh, with interest in studying novel blood tests that detect uh, kidney rejection. Great. And Dr. Christian Murthy or Dr. Sam, as uh, a lot of people call you? Um, thank you so much, Tim. Uh, my name's uh, Dr. Sam, and I'm also a transplant nephrologist um, working with uh, Dr. Queso and uh, Dr. Barth here at University of Chicago. Um, I also do um, evaluations of um, uh, dialysis patients and kidney um, disease patients to see if they're eligible for a kidney transplant, kidney donor evaluations, and I take care of transplant patients after their transplant. Fantastic. And let's uh, jump right into the questions. We do want to remind our viewers, though, that if you do have a question for one of our experts, just type them in the comment section. We'll get to as many as possible over the next half hour. And uh, Dr. Kisa, we're going to start with you uh, and, and just have you tell us, uh, kind of start off in a broad term here, why would someone need to undergo an organ transplant if, if they, they need a new kidney? How does that work? Sure. Uh, so first I want to start talking about a little bit the main functions of the kidney. Uh, so the kidney has really three main functions, and one would be eliminating, eliminating the extra fluids in the body, second, cleaning and clearing the blood from the toxins, and it also produces uh, hormones to regulate uh, our blood pressure and produce red blood cells from the bone marrow. Now patients with advanced uh, kidney failure, especially when the kidney declined below 20%, they start having symptoms uh, of that, which includes the fluid accumulation in their body. Uh, sometimes they may start having nausea, vomiting, uh, uh, they lose the, uh, their appetites, uh, and they become severely anemic. Uh, so the treatment with that would be either kidney transplantation, which is the best modality, and sometimes we can also do dialysis as a bridge. Uh, the benefit of kidney transplant, for example, compared to dialysis would be they don't have to go three or four hours several times a week uh, to uh, be on the dialysis machine, and that will uh, give them a lot of free time to go back to work and function normally. Also, once they receive the kidney transplants, uh, their body will get rid of all the extra toxins, and the patient feel it. Their appetite will improve, their energy gets better, and they start tasting food. Some patients actually tell me that even their skin color gets better. Uh, also, studies have shown that patients who receive kidney transplants uh, live longer compared to staying to dialysis. So uh, I advise every patient with advanced kidney disease to come forward for evaluation, and hopefully we'll get them transplanted. So Dr. Kesha, do people have to wait a long time for kidney transplants? Is that one of the organ transplants where people are on the list for for, you know, because you hear the stories that they're on the list for months or possibly even years. 
Right. Th this is an excellent question. So it's, it depends actually on several factors. So in the case of living donor kidney transplant, uh, this is a pro this a process can actually happen within a short period of time once the recipient and the donor are ready for the surgery, and it can take sometimes uh, maybe several weeks to a few months. Now, in the case of deceased donor kidney transplants, the waiting time depends on a couple of factors. One is the blood type of the recipient. A uh, patient with a blood type, for example, A or AB, tend to wait a little bit less just because of their blood type characteristic. I would say maybe on average around three years of plus minus. Patient with a blood type O, uh, for example, or B, tend to wait a little bit longer, and this can be up to five to seven years. Uh, the good thing that once a patient starts on dialysis, uh, the clock starts from day one of dialysis. So if someone comes in to me for evaluation, I start their time from day one of dialysis. Once we list them, we count all of that time. Uh, uh, there are special cases, for example, patients who received more than one organ, like in the case of liver kidney transplants or heart kidney transplants. Uh, uh, these patients require an urgent intervention, an urgent transplant. So this actually can happen within a very short period of time, could be a few days in certain cases when they come in very sick to the hospital. So I'm kind of curious, when we talk about multi-organ transplants, and, and any one of uh, you doctors can take this, is it more common when you see if, if one organ fails that, that multiple organs then start having issues? Is that, do you see that a lot? Uh, so uh, really the, uh, the way I present it to patients, the kidneys are very interesting organs that talk to other organs. So if the heart is not doing well, uh, it's very likely that the kidneys will fail. Same thing goes with the liver and the kidney. If the liver is not doing well, it's very common to see advanced kidney failure. Uh, so we often see that when patients come into the hospital with advanced liver or heart disease, they require a liver or heart transplant. So actually we do evaluate them to see whether they need a kidney transplant along with heart transplant or along with liver transplant. Uh, at the University of Chicago, actually, we've done uh, several triple organ transplants, probably anywhere, more than anywhere else in the world. We've done liver, heart, and kidney transplant at the same time. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a very interesting, uh, interesting information. Dr. Sam, how long is, is kidney disease manageable? Um, so I would start the answer by saying it, it really depends. Um, there are so many different causes of kidney disease. Um, some of which we have uh, treatment options um, that can keep the kidney um, function going for as long as it can. Uh, like Dr. Keso was saying, um, the kidneys not only clean the blood from toxins and take care of your fluid balance, uh, but at the same time, they also produce hormones. Um, we look at a number called GFR, um, or roughly we kind of equate it to as like a percent of how much your kidneys are functioning. Um, and most um, and all kidney diseases affect both kidneys. So when a patient's kidney function um, reaches about 20 to 30%, that's when we start seeing um, the effects and the patients also start seeing um, symptoms from these um, lack of hormones that they might start becoming anemic, they might start having um, difficulty in producing vitamin D in their body. Um, and these can start having long-term deleterious effects from this point onwards. Um, just like how the clock for being on transplant starts when you're on dialysis, um, you could get listed even earlier for a transplant um, when your kidney function reaches that GFR of about 20 um, to 25, and um, the clock can start ticking sooner in that case. Um, and a lot of times the decision to um, start dialysis is made on different factors, including um, your lab numbers and how um, you are feeling and how much fluid you have on board as a patient. Um, and so it's manageable to a different degree for different patients, depending on their age, what other diseases they have, like liver disease and heart disease that uh, Dr. Keso briefly mentioned about, um, and um, what their reserve is otherwise. Um, for their kidney function. Um, so on a case-by-case -case basis, it um, definitely differs as to how long we can medically manage it, which is why we um, really encourage our patients, um, depending on the speed at which they're losing their kidney function, um, to start thinking about transplant when they reach that GFR of about 20 uh, to 30. 
Interesting. So I do want to remind our viewers that we will take your questions. Just type them in the comments section and we'll ask our, our experts here to uh, answer uh, those questions. Uh, Dr. Barnes, let's, let's move to you for a moment and, and talk to us a little bit about kidney donations, specifically from living donors. And, and why is that ideal? Well, it's a great month to talk about it because it is our Donate Life Month. And really, you know, I think at the point where Dr. Sam or Dr. Chieso have patients that, that they recognize are going to need a transplant, they introduce and during a transplant evaluation, they'll meet with a surgeon and a nephrologist that they've probably dealt with before and a full multidisciplinary team of nurses and other providers. The thing I tell them first is that the most important thing they can do to kind of take control of their future is to try to identify a living donor. And a living donors is really just such a remarkable difference in the ability to potentially avoid dialysis and never even need to go on to a machine that requires you know, daily treatments uh, throughout their life um, and, and get them the maximum survival benefit of an organ transplant. So we, we start these conversations of who in your life you know, may be interested in donating and then share with them what we can do with, with both their disease as a potential recipient and then how the donor processes work as well. Perfect segue for a video that we have. Thank you for that because this is uh, this is really helpful. And John, I, if we can go ahead and play this. This is a video uh, dealing with uh, both a donor recipient and we also have the the donor uh, in the video. And and let's play that and then we'll talk about that coming out. We're both back running. We both feel really good. really tell easily is my time's gotten a lot slower. That's one of the first symptoms that showed up. I have polycystic kidney disease and it's a hereditary disease and cysts grow on your kidneys and eventually um, kind of choke out the, the, the actual, the real function of the kidneys. It's, it's just an amazing sacrifice. It's, it's, it's humbling to, to, to see him to, you know, be willing to do this and just, you know, a great friend and it just, yeah, it's, I mean, it's just amazing. He's a really great guy. And like I said, he never put any kind of pressure on you, you know, and he's like never complained. And so, yeah, he's a really good guy. So my kidney found a nice home. Rich not only participated by taking care of himself in terms of eating healthy and keeping his weight at a healthy uh, state and staying active, he also participated in our Living Donor Champion program. Uh, that is a program that is unique to the University of Chicago and what we do is we teach the recipients how to tell their story and how to go about asking others to potentially donate an organ. That's a very difficult thing. I mean, you're not asking somebody to loan you a cup of sugar. You're asking somebody to go through a surgical procedure. The surgery went very well, um, successful. We're both back running. We both feel really good. And we're both really happy at, you know, everything that kind of transpired at the University of Chicago. This is really um, one of the truly altruistic things that is done. It, it's a gift. It's the gift of life and it is the ultimate altruistic gift. I love that story for so many different reasons and I do want to give credit because John who's our technical director, John Dicko who sits back in the booth, is our technical director and director of the show. He also actually did the videography on that uh, that piece too and those cool shots of them jogging, John did, did that as well so kind of neat stuff. But a couple of points from that video I love the two kidneys are for sissies t-shirts, <laughs> that, uh, that is, is neat, but, but just the, 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 the comments that they made and, and just that, you know, this is a tremendous gift that you can give to another human being, which I just can't be, I, I don't think that can be overstated. It's, it's just such a, a selfless thing to do. And you saw, and this is the other thing about that video that I think is so powerful, the donor and the recipient were back running in just a matter of weeks. So it, it, the, the, the recovery from this is pretty impressive. It really is it's such a great story and kind of typifies kind of so many of the elements of why living donation is preferable outside of just the medical and the scientific outcomes, which we know are, are far more superior. I think that, you know, one of the things that, that we really do focus on is, 
is the donor operation and making sure that these donors now through the, the least invasive ways of possible of having surgery can get back to, to full speed and, and do these wonderful things. I think what you sense from that video is really how joyful kidney transplantation is. And you know, not many people would be excited if a doctor said you need to have surgery. Yeah. But in transplantation, we kind of deal in this very special field where it really is an amazing experience. And especially when there's a living donor and a recipient there, we really have a, a surgery that people are so happy about. It's, it's a special event. As the donor mentioned, his kidney found a, a good new home. Yeah. So that was nice. So uh, we do have some questions from viewers coming in. And, and uh, this one actually tees up perfectly with what we just saw. What is recovery like for living donors? And Dr. Barth, if you can help us out with that. So we recently introduced a, a new technique to the University of Chicago for donation. We've, for a decade, almost two decades, been doing minimally invasive surgery. Mm -hmm. But now we, we've kind of introduced what we really define as the least invasive technique offered anywhere, which really through an incision uh, that's only just longer than an inch through the belly button uh, can do the entire operation. The donors literally go to the recovery and wake up with a Band-Aid, or actually it's half a Band-Aid over their belly button and then about half of them will go home the next day. Uh, so, so really we're talking about a, a major operation, but we're doing it through these really advanced, minimally invasive ways. People are home in short order and then back to work. I still encourage the patients to really take care of themselves, give themselves a break for doing such a wonderful thing. These great people sometimes are so motivated, they wanna just get back to <laughs> life as usual the next yes. day, but give their bodies a little time for recovery. And generally within a couple of weeks are doing everything that they used to be doing. Yeah, if I remember correctly, when we interviewed those uh, two fellows for the runner story, I think they, they didn't, 100% adhere to their doctor's advice as far as taking it easy for a while. They were, they were anxious to get back going. But the wonderful thing is they felt so good that they could. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's one of the things that's amazing is the recipients who are suffering the consequences of renal disease and feeling ill, you know, immediately with a transplant uh, notice just the, all these changes in their body and their life and just feel the best they've ever felt. And you could really kind of see that between the two of them. So I wonder if you could kind of walk us through how the process works just from a, a surgical standpoint because um, I, I know you work on you work on both sides, actually. Right. You so so if if somebody is uh, working with uh, their their friend, their living donor, whomever that's giving them a kidney, do we have two ORs that we set up and kind of side by side? How does that work out? I mean, the logistics of it are, are really important, and I think that the most important aspect of living donation is safety mm -hmm. and that really that the donor who's doing this amazing generous gift this life-saving act uh, that the team dedicated to that person is only looking at the safety for that individual and that this surgery is not only a wonderful event for for them and, and their recipient obviously but that it's it's really a safe event i kind of describe it as two flights taking off from an airport going to the same locations but each team is uniquely dedicated to make sure that, that everything is really uh, maximized in terms of the efficiency, the flow of the operation. Logistically, you're absolutely right. We generally have two operating rooms mm -hmm. and the one team starts working on the donor operation, notifies the recipient team as they're getting close to, to the final steps of kidney removal. Uh, in the second operating room, the recipient team uniquely is focused on getting that recipient ready and we try to hand off that kidney uh, so, so it has very little time uh, between the donation event and between it's hooked up and making you know all the wonderful things that a, a kidney should do. So start to finish how long will you be in there doing that work? The donor operation can generally be about two to three hours. The recipient operation ironically sometimes can be shorter uh, okay. uh, than that but uh, the, the total day I think generally when I tell patients what to expect, I say around lunchtime someone will be talking to you and as we all know lunch sometimes is early and lunch is sometimes late, but that's kind of what we shoot for as a team. That's great. More questions from viewers. Um, if I want to donate my kidney but I'm not a match for a family member who needs it, can I still help someone? And maybe uh, Dr. Queso, could we uh, throw this one to you? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so first I want to thank all donors since we are in the month of donors and I really consider kidney donors as heroes. They are not only saving the life of the recipient, but they're also saving another deceased kidney to go to someone else. And uh, the answer to the question is uh, yes, they still can donate. Uh, we have uh, what's called a swap or exchange program. If the recipient and the donor, uh, they are not a match in terms of their either blood type 
or in certain cases, the recipient can have antibody against the donor. Uh, so we can actually uh, bring another couple who are also not a match and swap these kidneys. Uh, so uh, we can at the same time transplant two patients by doing this exchange or swab program. And uh, the other couple, actually, they don't even have to be from the same center. So sometimes we uh, swap kidneys uh, from other states. And, and, and there are certain cases where we can have three or four different couples. So it become like uh, 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 maybe around eight people go in that uh, exchange program and all of them will get transplanted. Great. And Dr. Sam, I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about the team approach that happens here at UChicago Medicine. Dr. Barth alluded to it a little bit earlier in the program, but this is truly a, a large group of folks that will work with the patient and, and, and potentially the donor uh, as they go through this process, and there's a lot involved. Um, definitely, and um, I think um, it's um, it seems like a very complicated process, but um, having more of us makes it easy. Um, it's definitely a unique niche where we work closely with um, with our surgeons, and uh, we also have other ancillary team members, our social workers, our pharmacists. Um, and financial coordinators, and um, we do that enables us to do like a thorough, comprehensive evaluation. Um, and you know, our most important job is to give our donors uh, the opportunity to ask every question and clarify every concern they have. Um, so this kind of team-based approach um, gives us the opportunity to um, do our job well and thoroughly and support our donors and our recipients through this process. That's great. And and from, I guess it depends on the patient probably, the time frame that you're looking at, but some of these patients uh, you get very close with, I would imagine, because you, you're working with them and their families for, for you know, in a somewhat extended period of time. And that's one of uh, the joys really of doing transplantation. Um, is to get to uh, meet these donor recipient pairs, um, really get to know them, um, and um, uh, to think, uh, you know, they always thank us, um, um, saying that, you know, thank you for taking care of us, but really it's the donors who are uh, doing this uh, for the recipient and um, uh, giving the big give and uh, passing on life to someone. Um, like uh, Dr. Bart said, like coordinating this um, surgery involves all this logistics. As a fellow, I watch these surgeries and the feeling you get when you watch the surgery, similar to, um, you know, like delivering a baby, there's an underlying joy um, as to when one kidney goes from the donor to the recipient. Um, and then we continue to see the recipient do so well, um, um, taking care um, of themselves. And we see how their life changes, how um, someone goes from not being able to do their job to get their job back again, get their life back again. Um, and like Dr. Queso uh, was saying, not just um, getting uh, the length of your life back, not just gives you longevity, but also your quality of life really improves. Um, and, and that's the joy for us to be in this field is to get to see that every day. Yeah, that just has to be tremendously uh, rewarding. So Dr. Barth, who are the ideal candidates for kidney donation? That's a good question. You know, I, I think anyone can, you know, be considered as a donor. And, and your, your viewer had asked a really good question, too, about the different types of donation. Mm -hmm. You don't actually even need to know somebody who needs a kidney to donate. And we're seeing that increasingly, too, is that altruistic donors who just feel that they've heard the story or there's something in their life that is kind of compelling them to donate. And the, the steps of really the first thing is to fill out a questionnaire on your medical history. Our basic premise for the donor is really safety. So we don't want to do anything to somebody who's got underlying serious medical issues. But increasingly, you know, we're finding ways for people to donate that historically we're saying, well, maybe you're a little bit too overweight, maybe you're a little too old, you know, the, maybe your anatomy to your kidney is, is a little different. And I think that the team working together is, is really uh, able to solve a lot of those logistics. We never kind of take chances on the safety side of thing or if people have medical illnesses, but really I think just that first step of calling, filling out a questionnaire, and, and letting us kind of say, you know what, it looks like this would be very safe for you. And as I tell all of my patients is, you know, people in their lives sometimes hear of their grandmother who died at age 100 with one kidney. And those are the people that we know that we want to find who can donate kidneys, that yeah. donation will change nothing about the rest of their life. 
That's great. And Dr. Keso, it's kind of interesting because I, I think of, as we look at the human body, you know, there are cer certain organs, obviously, like the kidneys that we have, a, have two of, but there will be people that will watch this and will say, well, gosh, I've got two of them, I need two of them. Um, can you talk to that a little bit? Because clearly that's, that's not necessarily the case. Yeah, now this is an excellent question. And, uh, you know, as Dr. Barr said, when we evaluate the kidney donors, uh, uh, our main goal is safety and that they are going to continue a normal quality of life and, and uh, length uh, after donation. And uh, uh, basically, although we have two kidneys, but in reality, many patients uh, or people actually out there in the community, they live with one kidney with normal life without having any uh, signs or symptoms of kidney disease, and they don't even have any uh, kidney problems. Uh, so it turned out that once a patient donates a kidney, the other kidney actually in the following few months, it starts to work a little bit harder and compensates for the kidney that was donated. And uh, by about uh, three to six months after the process of donation, uh, the kidney numbers kind of uh, stabilize and we see that on the blood test. So in the immediate per period after donation, one of the main uh, numbers that we check, uh, we call the serum creatinine or the level of the creatinine. It can increase uh, because all of a sudden the body now have one kidney, but then the other kidney start working uh, harder and compensate for that. And we see the nice improvement of the kidney numbers, which is the creatinine, one of the main uh, numbers we follow. And, and most patients really live normal life. Uh, they don't have any uh, symptoms or any uh, side effects or complications from donating that kidney. That's great. So I am curious, and, and, and Dr. Barth, you can probably answer this one for us. Can an adult kidney be given to a child uh, if, if your parent, for Abs example, wanted? Absolutely, okay. and I think that, you know, for, for real children, that's one of the most common kind of uh, combinations we see. Is, How does that work, parent though? To because child. just the size differential, this, I would think, would be challenging. The size is, is different, but uh, I think that eventually th those children with healthy organ function grow up to be adults, and, and that even though that the kidneys are larger, uh, you know, the surgery changes a little bit, uh, we again have specialized kind of surgical teams, anesthesia teams that will focus on the, that child's procedure. It is uh, a bit unique and requires some uh, additional expertise. But, but that is one of the most uh, common ways that pediatric transplants occur. Ironically, in the adult world, one of the most common ways that donation occurs is an adult child, somebody in their 20s through 50s, mm -hmm. maybe older, donating to a parent who may be in their 60s, 70s, or even older. Yeah. And so that gift that sometimes happens for kids as recipients is oftentimes we see that uh, for the adult recipients as well. Boy, what a wonderful thing. Yeah. I and mean, that's just really, really neat to, to hear about that. So, Dr. Sam, I'm going to let you wrap us up. We've got about a minute left, but talk to us, first of all, just about the importance of donating and how can someone become a living uh, kidney donor? Um, I think uh, living donation um, is an amazing um, thing that one could do, um, whether there is an intended recipient or not. Um, organ scarcity is a real issue. Um, we have a lot of our kidney disease patients who are waiting to get a kidney. Um, and I think living donation is um, one of the wonderful ways for them to be able to shorten that wait time um, to um, get a kidney while they're still healthy and they haven't developed further um, medical conditions while being on dialysis. Um, and um, it is our job to make it easy um, if you are thinking about donating a kidney. Um, so um, you, all you have to do is give us a call. Um, um, let us know that you are interested in being a kidney donor, um, and we will do the work um, to go into your history and make sure um, that uh, we are able to give you uh, the safety net that you need um, to be able to donate a kidney and determine if you are a good um, kidney donor. Um, and do the process uh, for you, which is why we have a wonderful team um, and we're here to support um, anyone who is thinking about kidney donation. That's great. Well, you three were absolutely fantastic. You, you did a great job. Um, it was really interesting and, and uh, you do wonderful work. So, so thank you to, to you. And a big thank you to those of us who watched and participated in our program today. Please remember, you can check out our Facebook page for our schedule of programs that are coming up in the future. Also, to make an appointment with one of our physicians, go to uchicagomedicine.org or you can call 888-824-0200. Thanks again for being with us today and hope everybody has a great week.